Hello, everyone. I'll let the uh, Jim wire explain, as usual. <laughs> All right. I, I found this font on the internet, Helvetica. It looks really great on slides. <laughs> you should check it out. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm Chris Wanstroff. That's me, if you didn't get enough of it up here. And I'm going to talk today about Python, right? Evil Python. <laughs> just, just not. But why? Why would we want to talk about Python? Well, I'm just bored of Ruby, right? This is a tweet, if you can't read it. Um, I have to find a new hobby since Ruby became my day job, right? So what am I going to do in the hallway here? I can't write Ruby. And actually, uh, I work at a company called GitHub, and we see lots of other languages. I didn't used to be like a polyglot type person, but since working there, I've met people in other languages doing different things, and I've gotten interested in trying out other languages. So it's kind of my hobby now is picking up a new language, writing something in it, and then pretending that I know a lot about the language after I've done that. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about the times I've done that, which has been a lot. Uh, JavaScript, turns out it's a really awesome language with really horrible users. I have this library called Facebox. It's a modal pop-up box, a, a light box, and has a huge mailing list. It has the biggest mailing list of any of my open source projects. And it's like the worst. I don't even want to open it sometimes. Just the, the conversation and the level of discourse there. It's just so if you need help on Facebook, I, there's a good mailing list. You should check it out. Um, <laughs> I, write, I write Emacs Lisp weekly. Um, well, I write Emacs Lisp every week. It's not feeble, I don't think, but uh, it's cool. And how, how else are you going to write Lisp, really, if you're not writing Emacs Lisp? There's no other real Lisp, really, except for closure. So Objective-C and uh, Mac Ruby, I've played with, dabbled. This is actually a Mac Ruby app, but I didn't have any other screenshots for Objective-C. IO, which used to be really cool. OOC, which is really cool, uh, Erlang, and then a whole bunch of other ones. Those are just the cool ones that I was trying to get like a book deal on, so I put them in the slides. <coughs> so Python, this is my favorite slide, by the way. It doesn't get any better than this. Python, whoops, you still hear me? It's a cool language. And uh, I've worked on a couple projects in it as well. The first one is called Pinder. It's a fork or a, a rewrite of a... Uh, Ruby library called Tinder, which is the Campfire API. So you see this a lot in Python. They'll take a, a library and they'll put a P in the front of it for Python. It's a genius. Um, but this was cool because it was a project that someone had posted. They weren't working on it anymore. I put it on GitHub. I added some features. Someone forked it. And it works pretty well. And this was kind of my first foray into serious Python development. And it was really useful because I'm familiar with the Tinder gem. So this is a rewrite. And I was able to kind of do side by side and get a feel for the language that way, which if you're looking at any new language, I think it's a good thing to do. I had a talk at the Ruby Hoedown uh, like seven years ago at this point, it feels like, where I was trying to encourage people to do side projects and learn a new language and that sort of thing. And I said, you know, just take Rake or something that you're intimately familiar with and try writing that in your new language in Clojure or Python because then you don't need to worry about figuring out what the program does. Instead, you can just focus on the language and the syntax. So this was a great way for me to do it. Is that for me? Um, the reason I was doing a campfire thing in Python is I wrote this bridge called well, you can't really pronounce it, IR camp or something. So it's an IRC campfire bridge. And um, instead of writing a campfire mode in Emacs, I decided I was going to write a campfire IRC bridge that would put campfire in IRC so that I could keep using my IRC client Emacs. That's the kind of person I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it worked really well, and that was fun. It gave me some uh, exposure to Twisted, which is their version of Event Machine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then the other. Uh, this is how you know I'm like becoming a true Pythonista, is because I took a library and I put PY in front of it, right? Boom. This is PyStash, which is the Python version of Mustache, which is my most recent project. And I actually hope people will use it that are Python developers, and it's not just like for me and my Emacs. Um, and then the final thing is LeafyChat, which uh, we made, me and Leah Culver and Alex Gaynor, for the Django Dash, which is like the Rails Rumble, except you have to use Subversion. Um, so it was 40. <laughs> Sorry. It was, it was 48 hours. We had to build a Django app. It was a lot of fun. I was uh, new to Django, but I wasn't new to Python at this point. I knew Twisted, and I'd done the IR, IR camp in Twisted. And so we wrote like a real-time Comet IRC client in your browser, which is lightning fast, and it was awesome. And um, it was fun because I learned a lot of Python idioms. I already knew the language, but then working with two Python developers and seeing them rewrite my commits uh, really opened my eyes to some of the idioms. All right. so. Python is interesting to me uh, more so than something like Objective-C because it's so similar to Ruby, 
which for a long time I thought that was a reason to not like Python. It was a way to make fun of it, and you know, Perl too. But it's, it's really similar to Ruby in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, the style is actually, one of the things I love about Ruby is the way that they do the style, the way that the code is written. And Python does it really similarly. So all the things I like, they do, especially this one. Um, it also has a really modern and innovative web framework, which we're all kind of know a thing or two about, and a really awesome event-driven network programming framework called Twisted, which is very similar to Event Machine. Um, they're both created by foreigners, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and uh, So they both have really similar roles. You can do web stuff in Python and Ruby, you use system automation, you can use it to write scripts for your Unix machines. Uh, people work on it full time, some people work on it part time alongside a language like C++. People do it just as a hobby, some people do it for serious stuff. And what that means is really they have very similar problems. The Python people run the same things we do, but they have different solutions. It's like if all of a sudden you doubled the amount of Rubyists, you have this whole new pool of people to pick, pick their brains. And so I've kind of been doing that, and I'm not the only one. In fact, it wasn't even my idea. Rack, as some of you may know, is basically influenced by this thing in Python called Whiskey, W-S-G-I, and it's Rack in Python. It's a little bit different, but it's mostly the same. And it's what they use for all their web frameworks. Um, Python even has a problem. It's too easy to write a web framework in Python, so there's like a thousand of them, which we're getting to that point thanks to Rack, so thanks, Christian. But it's really helped the, the servers. You can play with any web framework in Python. You can run it on your server, mod Python, mod Whiskey, and it'll just work, which is now what we're experiencing with Rack. Uh, RIP is a project that I worked on over the summer, and it's taking a break right now, but it will soon come back. And it's influenced by um, virtual env and pip. So what I did is I took pip, and I changed the first letter to an R for Ruby, and <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. So we're going to talk about some things that we can steal from Python, some, some good ideas they have, just some different ideas, and what can we bring back to our community? And you know, maybe they can look at our community and take some things to theirs as well, <clears throat> like rake. Uh, <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about the language a little bit. I'm going to give it a, a high-level overview of, of the cool things. So the VM space. Uh, one of the things I initially liked about Python when I was checking it out is there's, there's, there's VMs that you would expect, and then there's the wacky VMs, because the syntax is pretty straightforward, and they're very open about the development. So it's super easy for someone to just have a crazy idea and work on a VM, get it most of the way working, and then just forget about it. So there's this history of like corpses of VMs in Python, which is really interesting to see all the ideas that didn't work out. Um, so Jython is their version of JRuby. It started in 1997. I think Sun hired some people to work on it full time, or they did, I know, but I don't know if they work on it anymore. And it was started by the same guy who started Iron Python, which is interesting. So they have Iron Python, just like Iron Ruby, runs on the DLR. Um, you guys probably all know a lot about the Iron Ruby because if you didn't, you'd be in that talk right now. So I'm not going to say anything else about it. Runs on Silverlight, right? PyPy is Python in Python. And it's, uh, you know, it's the, the self-hosting dream, the, the kind of the Rubinius pie in the sky. And it's cool because what they do is they have a strict subset of Python called RPython, which is restricted Python. And so it takes out a lot of the dynamic parts of the language, and it makes it really easy for them to compile RPython to C, to Java bytecode, or to whatever .NET has. And so that's how that project works. It's also interesting because it's uh, funded by the European Union. I guess you can get grants from that. Um, and what they do is they're targeting C Python compatibility, just like we're trying to do. So stackless Python is, is a cool one because it's like a VM or a fork that has a very specific uh, need, a very specific target, a, a goal it's trying to solve. And for them, it's concurrency. So stackless Python uh, has these things called microthreads or tasklets, which are similar to Erlang processes or Go routines, if we're going to be putting the first letter thing. And um, they're cool because they're lightweight. You can have tons of them. You can serialize them to disk. You can pick them off a disk later and can, uh, continue processing with them. And it's interesting because it's not just a toy. There's a, a big multiplayer online game called EVE Online, where it's kind of like space trading and all that sort of thing. And all, all their servers are written using stackless Python. I used to actually used to play that game. That, there's nothing else there. But um, <laughs> stackless Python is almost all the way compatible with normal Python, except for the parts that are stackless. All right, so unladen swallow is one that's been in the news lately. <laughs> it's a, Python is a Monty Python reference, so there's, they go overboard with it, I think, and sometimes. But um, Unladen Swallow is, it's, it's not a totally separate VM, it's a fork. Or no, it's not a fork. That's exactly what I didn't want to say. It is not a fork of the VM of CPython, it's a branch. So the idea here is they're going to make Python four times faster, much faster, and then they're going to contribute all their patches upstream. 
And uh, it's, it's run by people who work at Google, but it's not officially a Google project. It's just sponsored by Google. And they're doing quarterly releases. And it's very open development. It's on um, Google code. And it's pretty cool because they're, they're very interested in making Python fast. And then there's CPython, which is our MRI. It's the reference implementation. It was started in 1989, and it's kind of uh, what all the other VMs strive to be compatible with. So that's the overview of their VM world. It's very similar. The ecosystem. It's green because of, nah. Anyway. <laughs> so the Python ecosystem. So these are the kind of the, some of the things in the community, ideas, idioms that they have that I think are interesting. And uh, aside from that VM part, the rest of the stuff is things that I've picked out that I don't think we have. So we have Jython you know, and all that. Um, Python does have things that we have, but I've left those out. So these are the cool like, Python specific things that are kind of new to me. Um, Starting with documentation. <laughs> They're really good about documentation. They're about as obsessed at, about do documentation as we are about testing. So they still have um, libraries that have full test coverage. They have test frameworks. But not every library has that. And they're not nearly as obsessed about it. It's all about documentation. A, a really, really good Python project is one that has awesome documentation. An uh, example of that is Django. And from people I've talked to, one of the reasons that they love Django is because of the documentation. Maybe they are already Python developers, or they were coming from PHP. But the documentation from day one has just always been phenomenal. Um, this is the Django book, if you've ever seen it. It's their A-Press book. It's Community Commons or something like that, so they can Creative Commons. It's all open source. Um, you can buy a physical copy. But they wrote it all in the open. And what they have along the side there, uh, the, the blurry little yellow dots, those are little comment bubbles. And you can see in there uh, the number of comments for each paragraph. So if you've ever used GitHub, and you've ever seen a comment on a commit, we stole that from this book. So, so it's cool because it was written in the open. People discussed things. And the book was kind of a community project. And it's free. You can go check it out today. They're actually working on a version of the book for Django 1.0 that this is a screenshot from. Uh, aside from the book, the Django site itself is, has really good documentation. And the screenshot doesn't really capture it. And it's, it's kind of hard to know what that means. But when you look at this Django documentation page and you scroll down, Everything is there, and it's not like this deep tree structure. It's just the model layer, the view layer, the template layer, deploying a Django application, and everything. So it's kind of like the Rails guides, but they've just been uh, polishing it for years, and it's very concise. And if I were doing hardcore Django, I think that this would probably be like my home page. I would just go there, I would find it, and it's all there. It's open source. People contribute to it. It's really well done. Uh, this is a project called Fabric. It's uh, similar to Capistrano. And this uses uh, Sphinx, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. It's not the search engine Sphinx. Uh, a different Sphinx that generates documentation. But this is sort of the standard documentation format you'll see in Python, including the Python standard libraries documentation. And it's laid out um, not as an API reference. You know, it's not class module uh, method. It's actual documentation about installation. And so that's kind of where it's different from us, where what we'll do is we'll have a readme, we'll have a couple other pages, and we'll run RDoc on it. We'll get a nice theme, and we'll publish that. But what that really is is some explanation and then an API reference, whereas in Python what you tend to see is just like essays on the code, how to use it, how to use it, problems you're going to run into. So I think that's something we can really uh, take away from their, from their culture. And it's something like us at GitHub in our open source we are just recently trying to do. We're trying to do like documentation-driven uh, development and stuff like that, where you write documentation first, and then you make the code and the test match that. So you kind of see how you would explain it. And if that makes sense, then it's probably a good idea. And if it doesn't, then you're doing it wrong. But yeah, I think better documentation. Tools like Yarv are really awesome. They've sprung up in the past couple years, weeks. Uh, and if you guys have open source and you're not doing a lot of documentation, you should give it a shot. All right, so pet is another cool thing that the Python people have. So we used to have this. I remember when I first became a Rubyist, there was the, the Ruby version of pep. So this is the Python enhancement proposal. And what this means is they have a website and a submission process. And you can submit an idea to pep. And it can be one of three things. It's either a new feature or implementation detail for Python itself. It's a Python design issue or like a guideline for the community. Like all projects have to start with a P. That's not a real pep, but that could be a pep. <laughs> and a process pep, which describes um, you know, how it's a meta pep, let's say. You can do process for submitting a patch to Python itself, uh, honing the process of submitting a pep itself, and that sort of thing. So this is cool because there are some peps now that are like legendary that are old. And when you're new to Python, they basically hand you the manual, and a bunch of them are peps, one of which is pep8, which is something that we should really think about. Pep8 is the Python style guide. 
So should you use tabs or spaces? Should we use camel case? Where should we use it? Should we use underscores? That's all formalized in the Python community under PEP8. Um, Google doesn't follow it with their Python code, but everyone else seems to do a pretty good job of it. And you know, for me, that's always one of the things I wonder. When I'm writing JavaScript, should I do camel cases or should I do underscores for method names? It's like, I don't want to, I don't, what I want to do first is figure out how everyone else does it so I don't look like an outsider, right? So PEP8 does that. You just go, it shows you how to import stuff cleanly, it shows you how to structure your code, and it's a really nice read. Um, PEP20 is uh, another fun one. It's the zen of Python, if you've ever heard this. It's basically 19 or so single line statements that try to describe the Python culture. And I think some of them are really good. Like, explicit is better than implicit. I know we don't always subscribe to that as Rubyists, but that's kind of how the Python people think. And once you read this, this PEP, you can really start to understand their code and get into the, into the mood. Um, flat is better than nested is another example of one. And if the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea, which I need to remind myself of all the time. So, another, oh yeah, there's an Easter egg too. If you do, their, their version of require is called import. If you do import this, it'll print out PEP20 in Python. Um, so two to three is a cool tool. And uh, I've not seen this before, but it might be a, a thing. So there's Python 2. Uh, right now they're on like Python 2.6. And then there's Python 3. And you can deploy your code on each of them or both of them. But as you can guess, Python 3 is backwards incompatible with 2. So there is syntax that you will use in 2 that will just break in 3. So what 2 to 3 is, is it's a command line script you run on code, on Python 2 code, and it'll print out a diff of what you need to change to make it compatible with Python 3. It's not perfect, but it's extensible. People can submit their own fixers, as they're called, and um, it'll help you find out what parts of your code are going to choke on Python 3. And it's apparently pretty good. So um, the Python community is really interested in making the upgrade process seamless and getting people to do it. They don't want to get into the situation where like, people are still running PHP 3 is true. Uh, and so on that note, there is PEP 3003. So this is a recent one. This was on you know, the news site, Hacker News and Reddit and whatnot. This is the moratorium. So what Python decided to do is they're not going to add any syntactic changes to the language for two years. And this PEP describes what that means exactly, what's a syntactic change, what's an implementation change, what's a new feature, what's OK to add, what's not OK to add, and the length of time. And the reason they're doing that is because they're giving the other Python VMs and implementations a chance to catch up. So they want PyPy, they want the other one, Stackless and all those guys, to be able to catch up to current Python. And they don't want to keep adding features and, and you know, making it harder for them. What they also want to do is they want to make it easier for people to convert to Python 3. So if Python 3 isn't advancing very quickly, it's easier for you to be like, all right, I'm going to get 2 to 3, and I'm going to run it, and I'm going to do that this weekend. And it won't be an old version of 2 to 3, or it won't be new changes that aren't documented yet. You have a, a long runway for upgrading to Python 3 without worrying about if the Python 3 you're upgrading to is the one that you know about and all that sort of thing. So it's a pretty cool idea um, to not add stuff for two years. And it's a good way for them to kind of embrace the community and that sort of thing. All right. So Python the language. It's actually a really cool language. If you, yeah, you might not believe me. Um, I really like JavaScript. JavaScript is one of my favorite languages. I've always thought um, that if Ruby is like Lisp, then JavaScript is like Scheme. Of course, Ruby is much prettier than JavaScript. But there are core ideas in Ruby that are obviously from Lisp. And there are core ideas in JavaScript that are different because they're obviously from, from Scheme. And um, this isn't one of those ideas, but that's just my prefix. All right, so the attributes in Python. I really like this. I don't like public and private and protected. I'm a little bit vocal about that. The, um, I'm just one of those people. And in Python, there's none of that. So an object in Python is similar to an object in JavaScript where it's just like a bag with a bunch of slots in it. And some of those slots have functions in them, and we call those methods, and some of those slots don't. So it has some cool implications and some horrible ones as well. But what that means is there's no method missing in Python. There's attribute missing. So when you call a method that doesn't exist, you're actually trying to access an attribute and then invoke the function. So if that attribute doesn't exist, you can play with it. You can give it back a function. You can give it back uh, a number or that sort of thing. So you can kind of get. Um, not as nice as P Ruby, but you can get DSLs in Python and you can get chaining and that sort of thing going without parens because in your attribute missing, you can invoke a function and then return the value of it. So th it's pretty extensible and cool. And uh, JavaScript needs that. The Firefox guys added no such method to JavaScript, which basically is method missing. Bad. They should add no such attribute. So you can decide if you want it to be an attribute or a function call. But all right, so where this falls down, everything's in one namespace. Uh, functions are just. Our methods are just functions uh, thrown in there, is instance variables. It turns out that 
having instance variables distinct from methods in two different namespaces, like in Lisp, is pretty cool. Because let's say you have, for me, uh, I had did some Python stuff with Redis. So I have a, a Redis Python attribute. And I want to store the Redis object somewhere, but I also want to use the attribute as a function call. Or I want it to be customizable. Well, what you end up doing is you have an underscore Redis attribute, which stores your, your, your back end. And then you have your Redis function, which is your front end. Um, same thing for configuration. If you have like a template that the first time you access it, you want it to compile, but you want people to be able to set strings or something like we would do in Ruby, where something would get cached, it's a little bit harder in Python. So you end up doing the same attribute name with an underscore in front of it. Hooks. All right, this is another cool thing. So in Python, uh, they have things like you know, less than, greater than, and all that. And it's not methods like it is in Ruby. Instead, though, the way that they let you customize them is you can write hook functions, hook attributes, that the Python interpreter will call. So let's say you have an object, and you want it to respond to a greater than. All right? Um, what you would do is you would uh, define a double underscore, like gtr double underscore. And Python will call that function, passing it you know, b, and you compare it against yourself, and you return the value. So it still looks like a normal greater than call, or a less than call, or a double equals, or whatever. And the way that you override the function is with one of these hooks. Um, another example is there's a double underscore str double underscore. And instead of calling to string on objects in Python, there's an str function. So you pass something in. And that str function will call double underscore str double underscore. So that's kind of how you do it. It's not how we would do it where you directly just override the method. Instead, there's hooks you have to kind of learn about. But once you do it, it lets them get um, pretty interesting. Another one is double underscore call double underscore. So if someone tries to invoke your object as if it were a function, Python will invoke that double underscore call hook if you have it, so you can do whatever you want there. Um, and then there's lots of parts of the language that use these hooks and expose these hooks. For instance, in Python, you can change the class of an object on the fly by changing what the double underscore class double underscore attribute is. Think about that for a second. All right. So uh, future, this is another cool thing. They have this, uh, this future module. You can do from future import x. Uh, the canonical example right now is from future import division. So in the newer Pythons, they're changing the way division works, the, the, the division operator. It used to be that if you gave it integers, it would like, do some rounding and give you the floor. And so it would work with integers or floats. So sometimes if you actually got an integer in there, it would totally screw you. So what they're doing is they're making it strict, and they're adding another lazy division uh, operator, which is two slashes. What you can do in your code is you can do from future import division. And you can today start using that feature, which will be introduced in the future in your code. So you can test your code. You can write your code against it. Even though your current version of Python doesn't support it, you can still import things that will be supported in the future that you want to depend on just inside your one file. So you can have code that is incompatible with other code syntactically running together in different modules using this trick. And so like I said, it's a cool way to, to kind of prepare your code to be upgraded in the future. OK, decorators. These are neat, too. Um, they can be emulated in Ruby. And I did them in RIP, but it's not always a great idea. Uh, this is how they work. Basically, it's syntactic support for like, higher order functions. So I have a modifier, and I pass it a random string, and I have an at sign in front of modifier. And then below that, I define a function as I normally would. And so what happens then is Python um, takes the actual function object that I define, unescaped here, and it passes it into the decorator. So modifier somewhere is a function. And so what you can do then is you can change the function, the, the unescaped function. You can wrap it. You can do things like add logging, disable logging, change what it does entirely, do type checking on it. You can do all sorts of things using uh, decorators. Um, what I'm doing here, which I didn't even realize, is I'm actually, this modifier is a function that's, calling, that's being called, and it's returning a function that's then having escape passed into it. Anyway, it's cool. You can do some crazy stuff with it. But what I'm doing here, what I'm accomplishing is, in, um, in, my, in my templating thing, PyStash, you have different tags that do different things. And so uh, I map the actual trigger to the function using decorators. So I say, if you see this guy, call this function underneath it. And so that way I can just add stuff at, at will and not have to worry about like, a, a dictionary mapping it. I just use a decorator that will do it for me. Um, and yeah, you can do decorators in Ruby, but sometimes it helps to have syntactic support for a feature. For instance, blocks in Ruby. You can do them in JavaScript, but one is nicer than the other. I won't tell you which. Um, Meta classes, OK. Python has meta classes, but they are not eigenclasses. They are different. Meta classes in Python, and I think most of the world, are classes that write classes, classes that create other classes. So what you can do is you can give a class a meta class, 
that when the class um, definition is finished, that meta class gets past the class you're defining, and then it can do crazy things to it. So an example is in Django, they don't have um, migrations. Well, they, they, have, they have migrations, but they don't do it the way Rails does it, where you define your database schema, and then the active record object picks up what the attributes are and columns and whatnot. Instead, um, in Python, in, in Django models, you define the attributes and you tell what type they're going to be. This is going to be a string, this is going to be an integer, and all that in your model. And what you literally do is you create attributes and you set them, um, you set types to them. So like string column, integer column, and whatnot. And the uh, models have a meta class that goes through, it finds those attributes, it finds out the type that you want them to be, and then it turns them into methods that know how to pull themselves from the database and format themselves correctly and whatnot. So you still get a nice DSL, and you just say explicitly this, this attribute is going to be this type of database column, and then you get enhanced functionality using a meta class. So it's a trick just to do uh, nicer DSLs, add functionality, and that sort of thing. Yes? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how the migration stuff works uh, all that well. There's a, that's interesting, they don't have migrations in Django proper. There's a, a, a plugin called South that uses it, and I haven't worked with it extensively. I don't do a lot of SQL these days. Um, I only put this in here because I was so happy to see it. They, they have args, splat, it works the same way as it does in Ruby. It's an awesome feature. I would have been sad if they didn't have it. But they, uh, they, they, they raised the, the ante, so to speak, and they have this thing called quarks. So these are keyword arguments. These are awesome. This is one of the best features of Python. All right, I have, some, I have some awesome code. It's all syntax highlighted and nice. I promised myself at one point I would never put code on the slide again, so I broke that promise. I also promised I would never do Python. All right, so here's a normal method. <laughs> uh, normal method call, you know, any, and same as Ruby, similar to Ruby, and I call it like this, right? So I have name and age, and it's not gonna do anything, so I, I pass in information. So what keyword arguments are in Python um, at the simplest level is this. So even though name was the first uh, parameter I defined and age was the second, if I pass in a dictionary and I have uh, the um, names of the dictionary slots match um, parameters, it'll work. I mean, basically this will work the way you think it's gonna work. Age then in your code will be set to 24 and name will be set to Chris in this method definition. So that's neat. Um, we have methods in, uh, in GitHub sometimes that are old and maybe they take four parameters, and it should really be like an options hash that you pass in with keys, because when you're calling it, it's a little, you have to like check the method definition. Um, what you could do, if you're lazy, um, if we had these things, is we could just put the names of the variables right in front of what we're passing in, and it's kind of a little bit self-documenting. It ends up looking really nice at times. Um, but that's just the beginning. So what you can also do is this quargs thing, um, with the double, double splat. And what that means is the quargs object, object uh, in your method will be a dictionary of whatever keyword arguments, whatever hash stuff was passed into the function that it didn't recognize. So here we're removing the age parameter, and I'm still passing a name, but I'm specifying age is 24. And so that quargs object now will be a dictionary or hash with a slot of age that maps to 24. So I can put anything I want in there and quargs will hold it for me. Um, I can also pass a dictionary in and I could put two stars in front of it and it'll expand it just like you do with an array in Ruby when you pass in an array and you splat it and it expands. Um, so one thing you can do with this that's cool that I do is this. I have a um, render function in my templating system and I just pass in the dictionary and it's a lot like the way Rails does options but it's supported by the language and it's neat. Um, okay, the next thing, doc strings. These are cool. This isn't Python specifically. Um, Emacs Lisp has these. I added them to JavaScript one time. It was horrible. Uh, but these are a neat, uh, neat feature. So basically the way most commenting works in Python is the first line of a function definition um, is a string. And it can be a multi-line string or just a simple string and it describes the function. And the reason you do that, <coughs> excuse me, the reason you do that is you can get access to that. So in the code you can find out the doc string for any function that was defined. And what that lets them do besides write cool tools is stuff like this. So in some Python libraries There'll be really simple test case in the documentation that is serving to illustrate how you use the function, but they can also run doc tests on it. Doc test is a module that comes with Python, and the doc test will execute all the code in the strings as like unit tests. So you can have documentation that serves as unit tests in your code, which is pretty cool. It's not a replacement for unit tests. I tried doing it that way, and I ended up with like huge comments with like every single edge case, and then you didn't even find the code. But it's nice to, to make sure that like your examples are actually correct. And um, I end up running doc tests on, on new libraries all the time that I find them just because it's fun. 
Uh, there's a thing in Ruby, there's a doc test library that does this with comments. So you put comments above a function and it will find the code in the function and it'll execute it. And it's nice, but it's a little different because it has its own specific syntax. So you have to kind of go out of your way to appease the Ruby doc test library. Whereas in Python, uh, the doc test library just works. So it's cool. It would be nice if we had that. Um, help. I just found this while I was writing the talk and I'm freaking embarrassed because it's so awesome. Basically, using the doc test and all that stuff, or using the document strings, you can run help on any Python module or piece of code and it'll basically give you like a man page. And it just infers all this based on um, hooks, like double underscore slots that you set. Like for this one name, um, I have this dis module that I ran help on. And the first thing is probably just because they put a comment at the top saying this is the name of the, the module, it'll tell me where the file is, there's probably a link, and then it'll go through, it'll find all the functions and it'll pull out the doc string. It'll show me how to use the function and what the documentation is. And this is all that generated dynamically on the fly from a module. Um, I ran it on the unescaped method that we were playing with earlier and you know, that's awesome. I don't know, it's nice. Okay, so Python's uh, import statement, it's module system. The way that you include code into other code is really awesome. And if you've ever used, um, CommonJS or like Node.js, they do something very similar. So the way that this works, if you've ever done any Python or play with any Python, you've probably seen this file floating around. And you've been like, oh, those guys, look at that. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing? It's actually really cool. <clears throat> so what this file means is that the directory in which it's located is a module. So let's say I have a directory called Django. If in that Django directory I have this file, when I do import Django, it loads this file, okay? It's because in Python, files are modules, which is awesome. Um, that means that there's no globals. So if you define a, a function in the top level of a file, and in, like in Ruby, you'd be horrified at doing that, right? It doesn't matter, because that is in a module. It's namespaced. So you can never really stomp on the global namespace in Python, because there isn't one. There's only the current running context, and then modules. So a lot of times you'll see code where they have a file and they just define functions right there, and it doesn't matter because they're in the context of a module. They don't need to go through that extra step of creating a class and creating some like false organization. Uh, so here's how this works in practice. This is from django.dispatch import signal. And so what is going on here is Python looks for this directory structure, it tries to find this file, and then it looks at all the variables in that file. And if it can find one that's called signal, It'll just link it, right? It'll just do like a, a pointer in the current uh, namespace. So that's how you pull in classes, variables, anything. They do this a lot with settings. And um, you can do multiple things at once. Here's one where from twisted.internet import reactor <laughs> protocol. I'm pulling in a bunch of stuff from the twisted internet module at the same time, reactor and protocol, using it later. If you don't know what you're looking for exactly and you like living dangerously, you can import everything at once. Um, and it's neat. You can also expose and control your API this way. So you can say, all right, I'm gonna have um, one main pi stash init.py, and in there I'm going to import all of my classes from other places. And then so all you have to worry about ever is importing from pi stash, where I can have this like deep, crazy directory structure that exposes all my internals you don't need to worry about. Um, for Django, this is really nice too, because when you're looking at Django code, they're importing features that they're using at the top, and right there you know where that code is defined and how they're getting it, and you can just go check it out. You don't even need to worry about actually learning that much about Python. You can just look at the load path, you can see it's Django dispatch, find Django slash dispatch, and away you go. Yield. It's a trick. It's not what you think it is. They have a yield keyword, but it's not our yield. It's different. Python supports generators. And so what that means is you can do things like, um, let's see, I should have wrote an example. It's weird. It's enumeration, basically. So you can create enumeration structures and control flow using yield. What happens is uh, with yield creates a generator and it returns an object you can call next on. And when you call next, yield will keep going. So the code starts, hits a yield, stops, you call next, and it keeps going. So using this, you can create things like, like iterators. You know, go through a range of objects, call next, and it'll just add one to it or whatnot in a loop. Or you can do things like breakpointing code. You can have a chunk of code with a yield, and then part two of the code, and then another yield. So each time you call next, you're actually going to different chunks of code. Anyway, I'll show you how that's actually useful in a second, because it's Sounds crazy. Um, Python has sequences, which are basically enumerables. Uh, they have tuples, lists, and dictionaries, which are immutable arrays, arrays, and hashes. So just if you ever hear people talk, if you ever hear people talk about that stuff, that's what it means. List comprehensions. I don't think that Ruby needs these, but I put them in here because they're cool. Um, 
basically, they don't have an, Python has no enumerable mo module, it, which is like one of the best things ever in Ruby. Uh, but what they do have are list comprehensions, which, well, they look like this. So basically, you're going to have expressions that filter an array or a sequence in line. And so here I'm saying, um, find every x in range 0 through 5. And then um, if you know, it's, it's even, return just that number. So it's kind of backwards because the expression is at the end and the return value is at the front. Um, but you can do this to do stuff really quickly and simply just like this filtering through a list. And one of the cool things that I found out you can do is if you change the brackets uh, on the list comprehension into parentheses, it returns a generator. So you can have your list comprehension be lazily evaluated. So you can do stuff like to infinity, and then you can do it, uh, run next on it until you need it, and then stop from there. So that's kind of cool. Um, this is really interesting to me because it says a lot about the way Python is implemented. Um, you can call this vars function. And what this does is it returns a dictionary of all the variables and what they point to in scope. It's, it's a dictionary, right? Um, so this means if you want to create a new local variable in the current scope, you can do this. So there's no name variable. I can call vars. I can set the slot in the dictionary of name to whatever I want, and then bam, right there, it's in the scope. Um, I mean, we can do this stuff all the time. We do this stuff all the time in Ruby with the val and metaprogramming, but it's interesting in Python because a lot of the language's implementation is surfaced as data types in that language. So for instance, um, Python supports multiple inheritance, which I'm not going to talk about because it's weird. But the way that the, the class hierarchy is, is stored is just as a tuple. So you define a class, you give it more than one parent, and then you can access that tuple anytime you want in Python, do whatever to it. Um, bytecode, I don't know a lot about bytecode, but I know it's like popular, so I put it in here. Um, <laughs> that's what it looks like. You get these little PyC files all over your stuff, and it's cool. <laughs> it makes it fast. Okay, um, here's some cool libraries. This one, this, I tricked you, I do know about bytecode. So you can give anything in Python to this dis library, this disassembler, and it'll show you the bytecode that, that it's going to represent, that's going to make. And um, so I actually was, I, uh, was working on a project, and someone, there's no loop structure. There's no like loop keyword in Python. So you just do like a while true or a while one. And so I had a while one in some of my code. And I replaced it to be while true, because I thought it would look nicer. And this dude called me out on it, showed me the bytecode, and explained to me that while one was more efficient using the bytecode. And I was like, OK. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you win this one. So you can do stuff like that. It's, it's cool. You can look at the code. If, you, if there's some part you need to optimize, you can look at what it's doing. Um, Rubinius could probably do this awesomely. But this is there right now. It's cool to look at. Uh, Sphinx I mentioned earlier. It's a documentation thing. It's, I thought it was going to be like RDoc, and I wasn't going to put it in here. But it's not like RDoc. Um, it's a little bit different because the documentation is based on, like I said before, essays and structures and that sort of thing. So here's an example. And it sets up an index for you. It gives you a little table of contents and all that. And it's a cool way to write documentation. Uh, PySoy, this, this, this is by far the worst name library of any language I've ever heard. Does anyone, can you just in your head, can you even guess what it's going to be? It's for writing games. OK. So you write OpenGL and physics stuff in it. Um, it has bindings to OpenGL and physics engines written in C. And then you can use Python to write a game. And if you've ever played uh, Frets on Fire, I think it's called, it's like a Guitar Hero clone for the computer. It's all written in Python using this, I think, and it's pretty cool. Um, NumPy, this is an interesting thing about Python, is they have a really big like, scientific computing community, like scientists and NASA people. Not that we don't, but there it's huge. Like, there are people at PyCon that had never even heard of Google App Engine, because they're like scientist people. <laughs> but anyway, they have really good libraries for doing that sort of thing, like NumPy and SciPy. SciPy depends on NumPy, and they actually have a, a full scientific computing conference. Last year it was in Pasadena just devoted to scientific computing in Python. So it's pretty cool. You can kind of eat lunch with those people at the conference. Uh, SymPy, it's symbolic mathematics computer algebra system, obviously. <laughs> Next. Uh, <laughs> so Mercurial, it's actually, we have a love, at GitHub we have a love-hate relationship with Mercurial because it's written all in Python. It, it, it's so nice, it's so nice. We wrote hdgit as a plugin to Mercurial and it's just like, you can understand the code very simply, you can like import it, you can embed it, you can play with it, you can overwrite functions, whereas Git is all C and Perl. Um, not that Perl's bad, but it's like C and then Perl scripts wrapping the C to do things. So Mercurial's just really well um, architected and it's nice to, to write for. And it's a cool system because what happens a lot in Python, which for some reason doesn't happen a lot in Ruby yet, is you get things like Mercurial and Track where everyone uses them and they don't even know that it's Python. They don't even care. It's just not marketed to Python people, it's marketed to everyone. So you should think about doing that a little bit. Um, Psycho, I thought this was a VM, but I was wrong. So what Psycho is, is it's a library, 
the C extension for Python that adds like a specialized just-in-time compiler to do stuff really fast, some stuff really fast. So math stuff, they say, can be 40 times faster. And so if you're doing a lot of that, maybe in conjunction with the scientist, you can load this in and get a big speed up. Twisted, which I mentioned, it's uh, probably the Python library I know the best. It's similar to Event Machine, but um, in that it uses the reactor pattern. But it's a little bit more uh, ambitious in its approach because they want to implement every protocol ever in Twisted and ship it with the, uh, the package. So that's, that's really cool if you're writing like an IRC library. You just install Twisted. The IRC stuff is there. You could just go to their website and find the documentation. And it's an interesting project. They also have a book and a website. They have one of those websites where um, if you Google Twisted and then you click on the first link, uh, their website will highlight the Google term. So the whole page will be yellow. It's just the worst thing ever. So don't ever Google Twisted is all I'm saying. Um, Django, everyone's heard of it. It's awesome. It's neat. They have some cool ideas too, like the admin, which I saw now that there's like a really good Rails version of the Django admin. Um, that only took us four years. There's also the, uh, the rack bug toolbar, if you've ever seen that. You slip it into your Rails app, and it gives you a little toolbar that you can turn on. It shows you stats right in line. Uh, they've had that forever. That only took us another four years. But there's some cool stuff there that we can take also. Tornado is new, and I only put it on here because it's popular. I've never actually used it. But I read the whole man page, so. <laughs> That counts for something. Uh, virtual env and pip, I have used these two a lot. These are the influence for rip. And um, it's because Python's packaging system, it doesn't have anything as nice as RubyGems' versioning. So you just have one version of everything. That's it. You can like, upgrade or downgrade or delete it. And so virtual env creates separate Python environments, including the interpreter. So when you make a new virtual env environment, it includes a full version of the interpreter, which rip does not do. Um, and it's a cool solution, I think, to that problem. And then people can, you know, trade virtual ends like their Pokemon cards or whatever. And you're going to have virtual ends specific to your application. And you can kind of debug it in the context of your application and not worry about what else is going on. It's super helpful if you're new, too. Uh, PIP is an installer. It works really well with virtual env. And it's nice because it can install stuff from Git, Mercurial, Bazaar, as well as from uh, the Python package index. PIL, it's like image magic, but better. I actually. I admit it. I, I have no idea what it is. I was told to put it in here because it's supposed to be really good. So if you're ever doing Python image stuff, pills where to go. SQL Alchemy is interesting. I play with it a little bit. It's a database library toolkit, um, similar to Data Mapper, but it's more about like I guess Data Mapper is going in this direction now. But it's very much about plugins and being a toolkit for doing SQL operations that you can write other plugins on top of and other tools on top of. So I don't think you often use SQL Alchemy directly. Instead, you use something it provides or someone wrote for it to manipulate a database in an interesting way. Uh, Nose is really awesome, and it's something that we should think about a lot. So what Nose is, is and it's an improved test runner and basically a better version of test unit. So they have their own test unit. Nose is uh, like test unit two, so to speak. But what's cool about it is it's fully backwards compatible with their unit test module. So if you have a test suite already, you can use Nose with it. You can use the Nose runner to get the improved output and the improved um, kind of runner features, some of which are very cool. You can also then just start porting over parts of your code one by one to Nose without breaking your existing code. So I think that's a really elegant way to do it, is to make it fully backwards compatible, even though you don't like that other library, because it gets users. Um, IPython, it's like. IRB on crack. You can save sessions. You can replay sessions. Um, you can have different sessions swap between each other. At the, you can swap between different sessions at the same time. It has colors everywhere. It's really nice. Uh, ASCII doc is cool. It's what a lot of documentation is written in. The Git documentation is written in it. Uh, the Fusion guys write out the passenger documentation in it, as far as I can tell. And it's basically uh, a lot like Markdown, but it includes like filters for highlighting source code in a different language and little tool tips with a cute little icon. It's all written in Python. It can output to HTML, PDF, man page format. It's really useful. We actually support it on GitHub now. And I want to start looking into it, but I'm not yet. Anyway, um, so the final two things I left for the last because they're crazy, Pyrex and Cython. Um, Pyrex is a language a lot like Python, but it includes C data structures. So there's like typing and whatnot. It's very simple. It's kind of a subset of Python. And it compiles down to C. So a lot of times, if you want to write a C extension in Python, let's say you want to wrap the discount markdown library. And you want to provide a Python API to the discount markdown library, which is written in C. Well, what you can do is you can write Pyrex code, which is basically Python, to do the mapping for you. And it'll take care of all the gluing of the C extensions, all the sort of like registering your module, and all that. You can write Python that you're familiar with, and then you can get access to a C module really easily. So there's Pyrex and Cython. Um, Pyrex is like cathedral. There's one guy overseeing it. 
Cython is the bizarre where they just take anything, including his stuff. So it's interesting to see how the two interact. But um, so that is my, my, uh, my 5,000 foot, 50,000 foot view of Python. The idea here isn't that you should learn Python. I don't care if you learn Python. I think the idea here is that you know, instead of like sitting down this weekend and writing the next testing framework for Ruby or another one, you should think about you know, finally trying out Clojure. I mean, there's some Clojure experts here, I think. Or you know, playing with something like Python or even looking at Perl. I mean, CPAN has like 16,000 modules on it, and it's a super awesome system. So there's a lot of ideas there that we can take, we can look at, we can evaluate, and think of them in, t in context of problems in Ruby or just ideas you have. So yeah, next time you want to work on a project, uh, do it in another language, maybe. Is that OK? All right. So thank you. Right. Does anyone have any questions? I probably won't be able to answer any of them. But. Where do you find Perl? Where do you find Perl? You can, uh, it's on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Any, OK, no? Yes? Uh, you said you were going to go back to yield. Can you do that? To yield? Oh, so I forgot about that. You're right. So. Up, 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 up. Oh, but you do. So this is actually implemented with using yield. This is why it's cool. So to go from a, a right away list comprehension to a lazily evaluated list comprehension, they do this with yield. So this is an example of something you can do. Where here, if I did um, on the object that was returned like dot next, I would get zero, and then I would get two, and then I would get four on each call. And that's like an example of something you can do with yield, where it's not like built into the language, and it's kind of a cool trick. All right, goodbye.